Right. This, uh, I looked at some general attitudes and characteristics, and we're looking now at the, uh, the sketch of the wise person, his relationship with his family, and I'm talking about the wise person's relationship now with his parents. And last week I looked at that a wise person respects his parents, and a wise person listens to them. And when we ended, I was talking about how in our culture that is just so much under attack. You know, the idea that, that a young person should really respect and listen to his parents is considered, no, that, that's, that's bad. It's being undermined because, look, you're, you're new and special and distinct. Nobody's ever experienced what you experienced. So, you know, you're a unique generation and your parents have nothing to convey to you. In fact, all they do is bum you out and hold you down. So... And you just see that playing out. And what that does, see, that's an unwise way to live because you then don't benefit from all of the wisdom that your parents can impart to you. So that's, that's where we, we ended, and I kind of went off on that a bit. All right. Wise person in relation to his parents seeks to bring them honor and joy. I keep wanting to look over here, brother. It's uh, hard on me. Uh, here, here you see in 10.1, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. 1520, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. And you can be saying, well, they're, they're just saying that, that if you are wise, well, then your parents like it. But when you get to the next one, you see this responsibility that you ought to want to do this to your parents. 23, 24, and 25, the father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad. Let your father and mother be glad. See, so a wise person cares about that, is interested in having their... Now, this assumes that the parents are wise, right? I mean, you, you understand. There are certain assumptions that are made. Like I say, with a parent, the assumption is we're talking about a normal, healthy parent, a wise parent. Now, I understand that we're in a broken world and that there are parents that aren't that way. But this here is where I say, let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. So a wise person will care to... Uh, honor their parents, to respect their parents, to bring them honor and joy. Now, why, what does that do? Well, that then puts them in this position. They're interested in bringing them honor and joy so they learn from them. And as they learn from them, that's woman wisdom. And then they are better able to live skillfully in God's created world. And so that's the connection that you see there. So we go here to his parents. Now, sketch of a wise person, his relationship with his family to his wife. And one of the things here, he appreciates her as a gift from the Lord. This is a wise way to be. Now you can, you know, when we talked the first week, if you're a woman, then you would put this in terms of your husband. But this is a wise way to be. And you see the text, it says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. If you have this attitude toward your spouse, that my spouse is a blessing, my spouse is a good thing, and I know that, some marriages are more difficult than others. But I say to you, in a good marriage, you will understand this. You will understand what a joy and blessing it is to traverse life with a partner. To go through all the things in life of having kids and raising them and sicknesses, that your journey through this life is with this person. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. You see, and that's this idea, see, but as you have an attitude toward your spouse that my spouse is a blessing and not a drag and a bummer, well, then it facilitates a good marriage. You see, and as I say, I know some marriages are more difficult than others, but I think that's the attitude a wise person will have. Appreciates her as a gift from the Lord, is faithful to her. Now, this is, of course, all over the Bible. I went back to the first nine chapters to get this one because it just says it so powerfully. But he says, drink water in 5, 15 to 20. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be for yourself alone, not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight, be intoxicated always in her love. You see, and this is something I think it, it applies especially to men. Now, why do I say that? I know in our world, no, everything's equal. No, there is a difference with men and women. And men are, you know, there's a reason they're portrayed as dogs sometimes. 
Why is that? Well, men's eyes tend to, they're very visually oriented, and they have a drive and things, and they, this gets men in trouble. And so what's the wise thing to do? Wise person says, no, I'm going to focus my sexual energy on my spouse. And that's what I've talked about before, about do you think pornography helps you do that? You know, of course it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. It, it, it makes it more difficult for you to find sexual satisfaction in your wife. And that's why part of the damage of it. But this is the idea. Faithful to her in terms of a, in terms of a spouse. <coughs> Wise person, sketch of a person, a relationship to his family, to his children. To his children, he wants what's best for them. That comes naturally, usually. That a wise person wants what is best for his, his or her children. You know, I mean, this is just, I think, as I say, that's a healthy thing. Most parents, normal, healthy parents, would die for their children. And so this, this is something. But I know that we're in a bent world. There are parents that abuse their children. There are parents that do unspeakable things to their children, and I know that. Okay? This is how a wise person is, wants what's best for his or her children. 2315, my son, if your heart is wise, my heart too will be glad. If you're wise and you are then skilled in navigating life so things go well with you, I'm happy. Right? Isn't this what you're trying to do with your kids? You want things to go. Why? Because it's a joy to you. That's what you want. 24, 21, and 22. My son, fear the Lord and the king, and do not join with those who do otherwise, for disaster will arise suddenly from them, and who knows the ruin that will come from them both. Don't get involved in this. Why? Because I love you and want what's best for you, and if you do that, disaster's coming. I'm trying to keep you from that. I'm not trying to bum you out. I'm not trying to just be a burden to you. I'm trying to bless you. And that's the perspective that you see. Then you can see some of the other uh, verses that we looked at before, 3, 1, and 2, 4, 10, and 4, 20 to 22. To his children, he wants what's best for them, blesses them by modeling godly behavior. A wise person blesses his or her children by modeling godly behavior. You see, 27, the righteous who walks in his integrity Blessed are his children after him. As he lives a righteous life before his children, they see that and absorb that. If you are a hypocrite, if you are a phony, do you think your children don't see that? Of course they do. You're trying to bring them up in the Lord and you tell them certain things and then when they see how you live, well, that's what they're seeing. Why? So what do you want? You want to bless your child. You want to train your child up so that your child loves the Lord and pursues his ways that your child will live a blessed life. Well, then if you're not modeling that, you're working against that. And so that's what you see. And then 23, 26, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. Give me your heart, care about me, and then you watch how I live. Okay, well, that's a big responsibility. Can't be a Sunday person who sits here and talks about Jesus and then goes home and talks like a drunken sailor who does these kinds of things, looks at girly magazines or any of that kind of stuff. Can't do that. Have to model righteousness and then your kids see that. You see, now that's, that's not an absolute guarantee that your kids will follow, but uh, it is a thing that would normally happen. All right, trains them up in the way they should live in terms of, of your children. You know this, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he, he's old, he will not depart from it. I said in the opening classes, in the in introduction, you have to recognize these are proverbs. These are general statements. You can't turn this into a law. You may train up your child in the way that he should go, and there are other influences that pull them. But generally, proverbially, if you do that, your child will follow suit. Your child will stay that way. Okay? So it's a proverb, and you have to understand it as a proverb, but it's a very important one. Train up your child in the way it should go, which includes disciplining them. Now, this is one of the things in our cell. Oh, you can't do that. You can't discipline your children. That makes you a brute or a monster. No, that's loving them. You see, we're just letting the world just turn us all the way around. 
he's completely crazy. Here you see 1324. <laughs> Whoever spares the rod hates his son. That's why I say it's loving. You spare the rod, meaning you refuse to discipline your child to train him in the right way he should go. And you say, oh, I don't care. Oh, no, just let him go. Do you think that's helping him? It's not helping him. And the reason you won't do it is, I, you know, I want to be his pal. I don't want him to think, you're his parent. You see, and you have a responsibility to train him up, and that includes disciplining him. He will be blessed for it. It says, whoever spares a rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. 1918, discipline your son for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. If you don't discipline him, you're letting him go down a road that here in the proverb it's going to lead to what? How many parents do you see with their kids on death row? What happens? Well, just, I'm going to let the kid go. All right. All right, all right, 22.15, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Now, are we talking about beating a kid? You know, you, you, do, oh, you can't hit a kid. No, I can. You see, I can. Now, you're not talking about in a fit of rage trying to injure somebody. Don't we understand the difference between discipline and beating somebody? Okay? I mean, does that even have to be said? You're not talking about that. And sure, there are people, as I say, there are parents who do that, who abuse their children. You know, beat them to a pulp. Okay, well, that's shameful that they would do that. That's not what this is. So what we do is we try to lump all things. Oh, well, then you can't touch them. No, I can touch them. You see, but of course, our society is changing, and this is all part of the of the fleeing from things of God so that it wouldn't shock me, and I don't doubt that in some states it's already true, that if you do administer corporal punishment, meaning discipline them, that it'd be a criminal offense. I haven't checked that, but it wouldn't shock me in our society. 20, 23, 13, and 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you'll save his soul from Sheol, from death. This is discipline. 29.15, the rod of reproof give wisdom. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. 29.17, discipline your son and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. You can't not discipline your children. There's a temptation not to. First of all, it's a hassle. You know, parents are sitting there going, you know, healthy parents aren't eager to go in and discipline their kids. Say, okay, who's turn, who gets to spank him now? Okay, nobody likes doing that. But you do it because you understand the child has to be... Now, there may be other kids, and I'm not saying it's absolutely mandatory. If you have a particularly sensitive kid and you say something to him, okay, uh, okay, okay. All right, so, but, but just as a general thing, the idea of discipline, the concept of discipline needs to be applied. Here we have relationship to his family. Now I'm going to talk about relationship with friends and neighbors. We first looked at these general attitudes and characteristics... Then we looked at relationship with his family. Now, relationship with friends and neighbors. He values them. The wise person values friends and neighbors. 1421, whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. 1717, a friend loves at all times. Not a fair weather friend. A friend's there up and down. Tough times, good times, a friend loves at all times, and similarly, a brother is born for adversity. So there are friends that are comparable to brothers in terms of sticking with you and being with you. And so that's what that is. 1824, a man of many companions may come to ruin. Got a lot of light contacts, a lot of people, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You understand, you've had friends in your life. You know the difference between a casual acquaintance and somebody who's really a friend? Somebody you can count on. Chips down, you can count on the person. That's what he's talking about. See, so a wise person values friends. 27, 9, and 10. Uh, oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. See, friends are beneficial. They're, they're somebody who help you. And I'll say something about that in a minute. Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend. Don't burn bridges. Wise person doesn't do that. Because friends are important in navigating life. They can help you. 
So a wise person doesn't burn those bridges and do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. That's kind of curious. What's that about? I think what it's about is in the next clause, better is a neighbor who is near than a brother far away. So have people in your life who are close so that in calamity, it's not necessary for you to have to run to a far distant brother because you have other people who can minister to you and bless you. I think that's what the person's saying. But in any event, you see the importance. Wisdom is a, a wise person values friendships, friends and neighbors. Here we have he values them. Anybody hot? Okay, good. I'm checking. He meets his social obligations to them. And this I went back to the first nine chapters. 327 and 28, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. And I take this to mean it is due in the sense of a social obligation to your neighbor. He says, when it's in your power to do it, don't say to your neighbor, go and come again tomorrow. I'll give it when you have it with you. You see, so here you are as a, as a piece of wisdom, as you live in community, with your neighbor, and there is a social obligation to your neighbor, don't stiff your neighbor. Why? Because that creates tension in relationships, and it's bad. It's not a good way to be, you see. It will wind up, the, the wise person who navigates skillfully in this world doesn't do that. See why? He keeps people favorable. You see, that's just, that's just part of wise living. Meets his social obligation to them. He does no evil against them. 11.9. With his mouth, the godless man would destroy his neighbor. But by knowledge, the righteous are delivered. 11.12. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense. But a man of understanding remains silent. 24.28. Be not a witness against your neighbor without cause. And do not deceive with your lips. 25.18. A man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a war club or a sword or a sharp arrow. He's very deadly who does this. So in dealing with your neighbors and your relationships in the community, you don't want to be doing these kinds of things of wronging them. You don't want to wrong anybody, of course. But particularly, you don't want to wrong the people who are in your sphere because that makes your life a bummer. Everybody's in trying to get you. Nobody wants to help you. That's not, a, that's not the key to a good life. So the, the woman wisdom says, don't act that way. That's what we would try to impart to our children. 26, 18, and 19, like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, I'm only joking. Okay, he's like somebody, see, who's starting a war. He throws firebrands, arrows, and death. You wind up deceiving your neighbor, and then whether before or after you say, well, I'm just joking. But what you're doing is deceiving them, gaining something from that, or otherwise you wouldn't be deceiving them. Well, now you've what? You've started a war. Why do you want to do that? You see, you would tell your son, daughter this, don't be that way. Oh, why? Why? Because bad things will flow from it. It won't go well with you in this world if you're acting this way. He does no evil against them. He's merciful toward his friends and neighbors. 21.10, the soul of the wicked desires evil. His neighbor finds no mercy in his eyes. Merciful to everyone? Yes. Especially neighbors? Yes. Why? Because you live in community with them. Now, some of this you just say, well, this is common sense, and that's part of how Proverbs work. See, Proverbs is in part something that you can discern from God's world. That's why I say when you have, you have ancients, there are Egyptian Proverbs and things, and you look at them and go, whoa, those sound pretty much like these. Well, why is that? That is because God has structured the world so that by observation, you can see these principles that work. Here, we're having it concentrated wisdom from the Spirit of God. So this is a thing here. Uh, be merciful to them. Show them mercy. A wise person in relationship with friends and neighbors is not naive about them. Okay, not naive about friends and neighbors. It said, many a man proclaims his own steadfast love. Talk is cheap. A lot of people can say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, you know, high five, I'm with you. Talk's cheap, you see, but a faithful man who can find. See, so not naive. Not just sitting and saying anybody just talk and I, no, but kind of testing and seeing who really is a friend. 
Who's really somebody I can trust? Well, that's good advice for living. You want to know that. You don't want to just swallow everything said at face value. You don't want to be a paranoiac. But you also want to have some discernment. You see, about when is a profession of love, when is there meat on that profession? That's what you want to see. And so that's just advice. Uh, he's not naive. He, he is a positive influence on them and vice versa. So with regard to friends and neighbors, a wise person is a positive influence, not a negative influence, not somebody working to pull them from God and faith and this kind of thing. You see here 1226, one who is righteous is a guide to his neighbor, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. One who's righteous is a guide to his neighbor, is a blessing to his neighbor, showing his neighbor the way to go. 276, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. We talked about that, I think, last week. But this is very important. You see that a friend loves you enough to tell you the truth. Now, what we're seeing in our society is a substitution of a love that's not love at all. In fact, it's hate. It is the idea that, well, you cannot say anything to somebody if it offends them. Sometimes we need to be offended. Sometimes we need to be told something we're doing is wrong. Who is it who loves me? Is it the one who tells me I'm on a path that separates me from God? I'm on a path that will lead to a bad life. Even though I don't want to hear it. Even though it upsets me. Who loves me? Is it that person or is it the one who comes and says, all is well? Well, the kisses of an enemy are profuse because they leave me in a position here. They don't really care about me. They care more about themselves. It's just being selfish. 27.9, oil and perfume make the heart glad and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. 27.17, as iron sharpens iron, this is from the New English translation, as iron sharpens iron, so a person sharpens his friend. Famous proverb. But see, just NAT puts it in terms of friend. Okay, what are we doing? We're helping each other. We're a blessing to each other. We're improving each other. We're not going out plotting how can we do evil. That's not a friend. That's some selfish guy using you. But a friend has a positive influence on his friend and vice versa. 29.5, <clears throat> a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. This is tied into faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. When you flatter your neighbor, you're setting them up for a fall. When you tell them, oh, you're great. Never heard anybody play the violin that great. Okay, well, what's going to happen? Person's going to wind up going up. That's a trivial example, but you get the idea. What are you doing? You're building them up for a fall. You're spreading a net for their feet. You're setting a trap for them by not telling them the truth about their lives. You tell them the truth and then they can navigate. You lie and build them up, profuse are the kisses of an enemy, and you have set a trap for them. And so that's what they're so friends, positive influence on one another. Relationship with friends and neighbors. He doesn't wear out his welcome with them. This is important. 2517, let your foot be seldom in your neighbor's house lest he have his fill of you and hate you. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty, that's good, right? I mean, you know when you come hang out somebody says, oh, you, maybe you haven't, but there are people like that. As my brother and I would say, they're in your soup. <laughs> you know, and just, just won't give you any space at all. Well, that's not, that's not wise. What happens? Well, they wind up, what, they wind up hating you. Okay, well, that's not good. So, you, so no, wisdom is, don't wear, wear out your welcome. You see, don't do that. It will be better for you. Oh, but it's great. I like, no, no, listen to me. You see, listen to me. I'm telling you, woman wisdom is letting you know. Don't wear out your welcome. That won't help you. All right, now here's a sketch of a wise person. Now we've looked at general attitudes, relationship with his family, relationship with friends and neighbors. Now in relation to his speech, sketch of a wise person, his speech, he's truthful. Now we've looked at this before, 
I'll just give you one. 12.22, we looked at this one under general attitudes and characteristics. This idea of being truthful. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. Lying is serious business. And I, I don't know what's, you know, it just seems to me in our culture it, is, it has gotten way down the list. It's become a peccadillo. You know, it's just, who cares? Lie, lie, doesn't matter. It's, it's serious. And woman wisdom says to us, don't do that. Not only is it immoral, but it, it winds up, if you can't trust people, if you have a reputation of being a liar, I, I, well, I'll tell you a story. My grandson, who's known to be a truthful person, uh, one of his so-called friends uh, ratted out some other guys at school, and then uh, when the, those guys came to that guy, he said my grandson had done it. As I told my grandson, now that was a punk move. But he goes over, and these guys start pushing on him. And he says, what are you doing that for? And they said, well, you told him out. He said, I didn't do that. And they said to him, you tell the truth, so we believe that. And I said, okay, see, a reputation of being truthful is important. Again, that's a trivial example. You see the idea. If you are somebody who, who lies, well, then it's not good. It's immoral, but it also doesn't help you in life. So when you're, you're a truth teller and you tell somebody, somebody says, okay, why? That guy told me that. You see, and it just people respond to you. They will trust you. Your life will be blessed and it will go better if you are that way. And you see all of these other t texts that I, I listed when we, when we talked about it under the general attitudes and characteristics. His speech is measured and thoughtful. This is a mark of a wise person, sketch of a wise person. 1019, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Don't shoot your mouth off is how we'd say it. Running at the lip. You see, use some restraint, some reflection. 13.3, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. 15.28, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. It's all right. Okay. Okay. I got to think about it. I can't tell you how many times people ask me things, and I just tell them I got I to think about it. You know, I just, I just can't... Uh, you know, I have to chew on some of these things are difficult. You have to reflect on it. Uh, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. 17, 27, 28. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding, not somebody who just explodes out. You see, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. Now, we have something like that. We say, you know, uh, how do we put it? Something like, you know, Better to let people think you're a fool than to open your mouth and prove it. Well, that, that's what this is saying. Right? Even a, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's deemed intelligent. You see, so instead of just rushing out and saying things, there needs to be this some kind of being measured and thoughtful is involved. 2920, do you see a man who's hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than for him. So there needs to be reflection. You see, words are serious. So I said, you know, you, something, you say things, you can't get them back. It's not like you got a rewind button on life. You say, well, everybody, I'm going to say, has said things they wish they had not said. And then when they're out, you know, those words are out just hacking and chopping. That's why I see reflection. I want to be careful. I wanna th it doesn't mean I, I want to be paralyzed. He's not saying that. But I want to be measured. That's a, so how will that help us live skillfully in God's world? Well, you understand that, right? I mean, does that need to be elaborated on? You, you see that if you are somebody who is not just erupting and saying things that create problems needlessly and upset people and all this kind of thing, but is measured and thoughtful, well, it'll go better for you. If, don't, you want your, don't you want your children to be that way? Of course. Why? Because it'll bless their lives. I want them to be thoughtful. I want them to be measured. That kind of thing. Speech is measured and thoughtful. It's uttered at the appropriate time. 1523, to make an apt answer is a joy to a man. And a word in season, how good it is. 
You see, there's timing on things. That's why sometimes you just say, oh, you know, I don't know how to say that. Well, we'll wait. I, I, not right now. There's timing with saying things. All right, 2511, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. 267, we've well, had that experience, right, where somebody has said something to you at the right time in your life, maybe you were bummed, you were doing this, and somebody came and said something to you, and it's like a drink of water. You see, what, that was, that was in, in season, a word that was delivered. 267, like a lame man's legs, which hang useless, is a proverb in the mouth of fools. In the introduction, we talked about that. You see that proverbs require application, you see. They're not just uh, like law, something you just come in and say. They're situationally specific. So sometimes you have a proverb, and if you apply it in the wrong circumstance, oh. you see, and I gave like the, uh, we have proverbs. You know, uh, many hands make light work, too many cooks spoil the broth. Yeah. You say, well, which is it? Well, it depends on the circumstance. So if you're in one circumstance and you come in and say one, no good. Do you see? So that's, that's the idea. And he says, 26.9, uh, like a thorn that goes up into the hand of a, uh, of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of fools. Okay? He's just like slashing. You see? Uh, 27.14, whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice, rising early in the morning will be counted as cursing. Why? The time's not right. Timing, baby. You see, timing. You come up and you're saying something good to him, a loud voice early in the morning, how's it going to be received? Well, I'm only blessing him, but the time's not right. You see, guy's going to throw a boot at you or something like that. Okay, uttered at the appropriate time is not boastful. This is something people, it, it will bless their lives. Nobody, nobody likes somebody who blows his own horn. It's just annoying. Okay, he says here, let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. You see, if you're, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm like the greatest, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, there's never been anybody around like me. Well, right away, you, you see, so, so what are you doing? You, you, what effect does that have on the people around you? Well, everybody sits here and says, the guy's a jerk. And then how does that help you in navigating life? It doesn't. You see, why? Because people don't care to help you. They don't, they don't like you. So wisdom is, listen, don't do this. Plus, it's, it's just being arrogant, you see. So these things are things that are wrong in themselves, but from a wisdom standpoint, you look at it in terms of skill and living. And so that's what the, that's what the uh, wisdom is, is here. All right, is not boastful. In speech is gentle and gracious. Well, everybody likes that, right? I mean, that's a good way to be. He says, 1218. There's one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Just rash words. Don't care. I'm saying it. That's not, that's not good. I don't care if it's true. See, so when I say that, you know, you tell people the truth, you don't mean that you tell them in a way that is harmful. We're never gratuitously hurtful, right? We do things to bless people. So this is the idea of not being, not being rash and just throwing out things. 15.1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I was in Phoenix, I don't know, a year, two years ago. I went to a bookstore there. I was pulling out. Traffic goes just this way, one way, and I'm looking down this way. As soon as it's clear, I pull out, and there's a guy running this way. And so I see him, and I just stop, and he had to, like, put his hands on the hood of my car. And he was mad. And I can see him, he's looking at me in there, and he's just like giving it to me. And so I just opened the door, and I just said, I'm sorry, man. And he changed like that. He just changed. And I also said, I'm an idiot. <laughs> because I am. But, but, you know, that's just an example. You've all had that, you see. I mean, just, if I had to come back to that dude, you shouldn't have been running. <laughs> You're going the wrong way. Why don't you look? Well, then we'd have probably been, I don't know, he'd have dragged me out of the car and thrown me in the street. You know, I was going to say we'd probably be wrestling, but my brother would have said, not you, man. <laughs> so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't throw that out there. If he, was, if he was somewhere else, I'd have said that. But. All right. 15.4, uh, a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Right? Breaks the spirit. You can do that. 
You can be harsh and cruel in the things you say, and you can break somebody's spirit. You see, so when you have something to say that's difficult for somebody, you really have to be careful, okay, how you convey it. You don't just come in and say, hey, I see he's doing something. I'm going to help him out, and I'll just come in and hit him with a sledgehammer. No. You see, uh, more's involved than that. 1624, gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. 2211, he who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as his friend. We watched, uh, what is it called? was that the PBS thing? It was a Wolf Hall. I don't know if any of you saw that. But uh, it was about uh, England with, with King Henry and this kind of thing. And it has one of these, uh, I can't think of the guy's name now who's playing. It's the guy who just won an Academy Award, by the way. But he played the lead role, one of these religious guys. I don't know if it was Thomas More or whatever. But you just see how he's just always, you see, careful. Now, sometimes to a fault. But you see that idea. I think everybody understands that. See, your speech is gracious. You'll have the king for a friend. You see, that's something that's, that's important. All right, his gentle and gracious is not, your, his speech is not gossip or slander. The one who conceals hatred has lying lips. That's a person who really hates you but will not air it and will not reconcile and will not, you know, get back together. Really hates you but pretends they don't. All right, well, that's basically lying lips, he says. And whoever utters slander is a fool. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. You see, slander here in a broader sense of, I have things about you and confidence and all that that I think would make you look bad. Well, I'm going to air them to your detriment. Why? Because I'm trying to damage your reputation and make you look bad. Don't do that. You see, what do you think that does to relationships? What do you think that does to, you know, how, you, how you're perceived in the world? But he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. 2019, whoever goes about slandering re reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a simple babbler. If you are that kind of person who takes confidences of people and then uses them to damage people, do you think people will want to associate with you? Of course not. Why are they, they going to do that? Who wants to get near you? You see? You're somebody who, who damages people, so they won't do that. Uh, do not slander a servant to his master. Even though this servant is not in a position of power, you're going to come over here and you're going to trash this servant uh, to this prayer. He says, he, he will, lest he curse you, he will call out to God against you. You see, and he says, and you be held guilty. So this is a thing here, just not gossip or slander. Uh, miscellaneous topics. Bribes and gifts. I'm just going to go as fast as I can. We finish. I'm going to try to finish Proverbs next week. Week after that, we'll start First John. Bribes and gifts. Whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates bribes will live. You see, bribes in the sense that you're given something that is to pervert justice. In this case, if I'm greedy, I take these things. No politician would ever do such a thing, you see. But you see, it's a perversion. It's, it's, it's something that's evil. He says in 17.8, a bribe is like a magic stone. Now, in the eyes of the one who gives it. You see, and it may be the fact he says magic stone, that may be pejorative. Magic. But in any event, the person who has it, you see, he sees it as a technique and a thing of opening doors. And it does open doors. He says, wherever he turns, he prospers. That doesn't mean it's right. But he certainly sees it as a magic stone that opens doors. And that is a fact of life. A fact of life is that bribes do open doors, and a wise person isn't ignorant of that fact. doesn't mean he's bribing, but what it means is he's aware of how the world works. You want to be wise, you need to be aware of these things. 1723, the wicked accepts a bribe in secret to pervert the ways of justice. 1816, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the great. Now, this is like a social thing. Like when you come, there are customs in, in, in China... Or Taiwan, is you, you come and you bring gifts. I don't know if that, but there are just sometimes there's custom. You don't do it, you insult people. You see, so there are ways, you see, you bring gifts and what? It's not a quid pro quo, but it's a thing that says, hey, I value you. All right, well, that smooths things. Okay, this is in a different category. 1816, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the great. 21.14, a gift in secret averts anger. That could be just talking about the gift. And a concealed bribe, strong wrath. That's one of these situations of, is that true? Yes. People can bribe people. 
And that's, again, it's not endorsing it because you see how clearly bribery is talked against. But it's something that you need to be aware of. If you're in a situation and don't know the potential of bribes, well, then you're vulnerable. A wise person knows how the world operates and so is in a position to protect himself or herself. Uh, 28, 21, to show partiality is not good. To favor, to play favorites, particularly in the justice system, is not good, he says. But for a piece of bread, a man will do wrong. You can bribe some schlub for a piece of bread, and he'll play favorites. But that's not how you're to be. Okay? Straight and narrow. No, no playing favorites. Just doing, doing what's right. Bribes and gifts. Emotions and health. Now, we in our society think we're the first people to ever recognize there's a connection between emotional health and physical health. I read studies, you know, every day I go through science studies just because of the creation evolution stuff. I like to keep up with what are the strange people saying. So I, I, I go, but, but, you know, so you, I'm always running across things. That, you know, some government-funded study, I don't know how many millions of dollars, and they discovered that this. Well, do you know that anxiety actually, hey, come on, man, you know, you got to be paid for that. It's just crazy. All right, 1430, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. 1624, gracious words, let me just finish this slide and then I'm through. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. 1722, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. 1814, a man's spirit will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear. You can also look in chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 that we talked about before. Uh, in the words of Porky Pig, that's all, folks. Thanks. <laughs>